Right. Um, hello, everybody, and um, thanks for coming out tonight to Social and Society Lecture on the infamous Summer of Discontent, which was the uh, 2022 Parliament protests. Um, <coughs> Uh, my name is Fergus Stratford, and I'm an executive member of the Society. Um, first, I'll just be giving you a quick rundown on tonight's topic, and then a little bit of housekeeping as well. And um, yeah, just handing it over to Tom. Um, for all new people here, the uh, Social Society was formed in 2021 as an educational group that promotes socialist thoughts and idea, a thought and ideas. If you're interested in joining or have questions for us, please ask one of our executive members. Um, we have events on every second Tuesday of the month and we also host uh, Friday night social drinks occasionally downstairs at Broken Vagabonds. Um, there is a social drink session happening on the 26th of April for all new members and anyone who is interested in joining and Broken Vagabonds have kindly offered to put some free drinks and snacks on for us. Um, so come along if you're interested. Um, oh, I'm going into a bit of a spiel now. <laughs> right. um, uh, the 2022 Parliament protest had many interpretations for a multitude of people, and for some, it was a chance to defy the commentaria, the government, governmental authority, polite society, and put previously fringe opinions into action. For others, it was a direct assault upon order itself, which needed to be crushed by any means necessary. I personally think after spending an extended amount of time at the protest as an observer and amateur photographer, which some of my photographs will be featured on tonight's slideshow, um, two things stood out to me clearly on what this protest represented. Uh, the first one was the breakdown of neoliberal water. And number two was the clear evidence of societal discontent and division, especially between the highly educated urbanised managerial class and those who have dared to oppose them. I still do consider the protest to be one of the most important political moments within New Zealand's modern history, even though it resembled a twisted frequency festival from hell. <laughs> <laughs> the protest itself was ideologically incoherent and chaotic, it represented, but it represented a turning point within the political realignment of New Zealand, with previously fringe and unpopular views now having a platform right on the walls of Parliament. The range of people who attended the protest was vast, from my personal observations. These people, uh, these groups included people whose jobs had been unfairly terminated due to the mandates, vehemently pro-Israel, millennialist, evangelical Christians, patch gang members, the vulgar petit bourgeois, Hare Krishnas, troublemakers, Rastafarians, what? Uh, neo Trumpian conservatives, the homeless, and many, many more groups which make up New Zealand society. I'd have to say one of the most entertaining moments of my time observing the protest was witnessing several extremely stoned black power members joining in the Hare Krishna drum and chant circle as silent but bemused participants. I don't think there ever would have been many opportunities within normative society for these groups to have interacted with each other. I recall Bryce Edwards' description of this event as a festival-like atmosphere, which I personally think that it was within the earlier stages of the protest, with a little open mic right on the steps of Parliament, encouraging anyone with a loud voice to come and speak on whatever topic they're choosing, directly contending with the Parliament loudspeakers which were blasting scientific facts about COVID vaccines, with bad karaoke also filling the airwaves. It really was an assault on the ears. Um, the media class, unable was, however, was unable to handle the fact that one of the most significant protests of our times was one of a reactionary nature, with prominent liberal media figures quietly discarding the ACAB posturing that they had adopted in 2020 and instead spent their time lamenting in Guardian articles that there was only a moderate display of state force, unarmed police and parking wardens. Political act actors attempted at the time to court fame with the protesters, with Winston Peters famously making his presence known on the grounds, later being trespassed by Trevor Mallard, who were then compared to Hitler. David Seymour was the first sitting MP to have engaged with the protesters in a semi-formal capacity, stating, there are com some completely unacceptable elements of this protest, but there are also a lot of people out there who are reasonable, 
are not violent and simply want to be heard. This could be interpreted as acts attempting to bring in a new potential voter base, with Seymour legitimising the protests and the demands in a press release which came out on June 2022, describing the protests as a symbol of frustration that is felt more widely than a few hundred or even a few thousand people camping on Parliament lawns. It goes beyond vaccines and even vaccine mandate. mandate, mandate. Um, pardon me. Um, uh, it symbolises frustration with a response that started so well, but has become increasingly forlorn, costly, and out of step with the world. Further in the statement, he says, Why couldn't a recent negative test substitute for being vaccinated? It is good enough for Air New Zealand and their passengers, so why not other workplaces? Giving acknowledgement to the original goal of the protest, which was the complete removal of all vaccine mandate. mandates. Brian Tarmaki, however, was not present there as his bail conditions restricted him from being on the grounds of Parliament. His Freedom and Rights Coalition, however, was one of the main factional entities of the, of the occupation. The protests were integral to the rise of the far-right media organisation Counterspeak, often known as New Zealand Answers, New Zealand's answer to Infowars. They played a prominent part in broadcasting the protest and platforming conspiracy theory-based content. They also shifted the goals of the protest while they also supported the end of mandates and the repeal of all legislation relating to COVID, they saw the protests as the beginning of a war and called for all MPs to be arrested for crimes against humanity. They eventually ended up taking control of the protests, snatching it from the Freedom and Rights Coalition and urged the protesters to resist and use violence against the police. As much as some commentators on the left and the right would have imagined, the protests becoming a war or an uprising, the commitment to resistance from the majority of protesters was evidently low, with police pressure forcing the majority out and only the fanatics remained. Their attempts to war against the state failed miserably, with the main casualties of the protest being the immense pile of discarded tents being left behind on Parliament grounds. Um, we hand you over to Tom now. Thanks, Thank you, friends. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll get straight into it, I guess. So, I'd like to start with a quote that has basically become a bit of a cliche at this point. It's been overused in this kind of area quite frequently, but it's from Antonio Gramsci. Um, oh, there it is. It's just a bit of a delay. <clears throat> the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. So the interregnum is an important word here that we'll be returning to a lot throughout the talk. Um, traditionally, the word has been used for the time between one monarch dying and the next one being crowned. Uh, taking it as a metaphor, the interregnum is the period between one system or order breaking down uh, and another being established. This period, though, can last decades, as it's never a linear shift on or, uh, from one stable period to the next, but a slow degradation of aspects of the hegemonic order where some things are reworked or retried and new options are put forward. It's not until the new order gains the general consent of the people that we return to a period of hegemonic stability. So the parliament protest and subsequent shift in the political landscape suggests that we're in a period of interregnum. Where this began is not as important, uh, rather understanding that the COVID-19 pandemic crisis precipitated the development of popular discontent into an articulation with anti-mandate and anti-government agendas, uh, showing that the previous settlement no longer fully enjoys hegemonic dominance. Rather, we're in, we are in an interregnum, which is supported by the protest being a highly visible display of contestation of the status quo. Subsequently, the current coalition, National Act New Zealand First Government, is, is the first government of the interregnum. This is further supported in, in the way that Act New Zealand First uh, courted the parliament protesters uh, during the last election in the process lending legitimacy and thus constructing them kind of as a political bloc and of themselves. So, going back to this old is dying, you is yet to be born overplayed phrase that we've, you know, it comes up all time and time again. Um, the period we're living in is one where subsequent crises culminating with the pandemic have led to a destabilizing of the previous hegemonic settlement of neoliberalism in New Zealand. This is somewhat applicable to the West more broadly, but New Zealand, like each state, 
experiences this in a unique way due to the particular conditions present within the makeup of New Zealand as a state project. Following this, I'd like to introduce this idea that I'm working with a little bit called dual crisis. It's, it's a good heuristic I've found for analysing and understanding the process of hegemonic contestation in New Zealand. The dual crises of both capitalism on the one hand and colonisation on the other, uh, though deeply intertwined, can be addressed separately, but must both be resolved in order to establish a period of hegemonic stability. A uh, recent example, I said recent, uh, an example of this, of the most recent type, I guess, is in the period that led up to the establishment of neoliberalism in New Zealand, the sort of mid 80s um, prior hegemonic reconfiguration um, around Rogenomics and that sort of thing. This followed an unsettled period uh, and resurgence of Māori activism through like things like the land marches, Bastion Point, Māori language petition, groups like Ngā Tamatoa, um, culminating in the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal process and effectively the codification of Tatiti or the treaty uh, in policy and governance in New Zealand. The settling of the colonial aspect of the dual crisis was a key part in the procuring consent and thus legitimacy of the neoliberal project in that era. The restructuring of the framework of capitalism in New Zealand being the other side of that settlement process. So, following this, there's a crisis of sort of legitimacy and authority that comes up during the, pro, uh, the pandemic. Um, so the government during the pandemic, particularly the 2020s of the Labour government that we had during that election, which is the first majority government we've had since the beginning of the MNP, resembles quite similarly to a wartime government. Uh, and that its response to the pandemic crisis had broad cross-partisan support and consensus within the House. Further, a lot of the decisions bypassed the usual mechanisms of democracy which have allowed, would have allowed debate on whether or not the policies were a good idea. This makes sense in context and was uh, potentially necessary in the case of things like lockdowns, isolation, quarantine, perhaps even the border closures and vaccination mandates. But it does represent a shift towards a more coerce, coercive state rather than one which leads by consensus. Because this form of governance was coercive and dominant rather than leading, it suggests a period of breakdown of the hegemonic order, opening the way for a, a form of contestation. Um, and that's where we kind of get to the point where the new is yet to be born, really. So we're living in a moment where, despite the apparent breakdown of neoliberalism, at least in its older form, there's no real compelling alternative waiting in the wings. Uh, two things are happening here. So one is a separate um, separation of ideological positions and common sense from its original position in the makeup of neoliberal hegemony, and a rearticulation of it alongside a more libertarian market fundamentalism. Uh, exemplary of this at the moment is the tax cuts at all costs policies that are coming out of the current government, uh, where there appears to be a doubling down on the defunding of, uh, or marketization of state services, uh, cutting public sector workers across the board, etc. I'm sure we're all aware of these things, um, all in the name of giving kickbacks to the property owning class. This could, in a way, be seen as an articulation of neoliberal common sense with a sort of neo-feudal libertarian hybrid ideology. So, moving back to the Parliament projects now, that it was a culmination of the articulation of popular discontent with a variety of disparate ideological beliefs and positions, all pivoting around a broad anti-mandate government position. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I'll just go really into loud. Uh, that's the dual process. I'm way behind. Let's go next one. Um, so how did it form in the first place? So first what we need to do is have a brief timeline of the pandemic. So we've got, you've got the period of, of border closures, you've got lockdowns, isolation, the traffic light system, all sort of uh, being established through early 2020, um, all the way through to sort of 2021 with vaccine mandates and vaccination across the board. The pandemic itself produced a lot of uncertainty, fear, and a sense of sort of not being able to know what's coming next. How long this is going to last, oh, sorry, words. Um, not knowing what's coming next, how long it's going to last, or, or how bad it's going to be. Um, that sort of terrain is primed for public discontent to be articulated with a whole host of different positions. The process of being in isolation, having uncertainty and fear, uh, and the public discontent from state affairs prior to the pandemic, so things like the housing crisis, the job market, uh, low wages, cost of living crisis, etc., all kind of come together to form an efficient process for the regular people across the class, race, gender, income, education levels, etc., to become what culminated the protests sort of movement. This happened as people had this kind of fear and discontent while also being physically isolated from the wider community during lockdowns, 
It caused them to sort of seek community online on social media, where both artists and belonging could be sought. The nature of social media being algorithmically driven is the algorithmic, the algorithmic drive of, of social media is what places people within sort of bubbles and echo chambers, um, where the more you engage with a particular kind of content, the more you'll be shown more of that similar content and so on. Once someone begins to find these communities, for example, uh, a good example of this is crafting and knitting groups on Facebook, which were the incubators for what became Voices for Freedom. Um, they became exposed to ideas and possible answers to their uncertainty around lockdowns and COVID itself through different community groups online. What I want to emphasize is nobody goes from questioning the response to the pandemic to microchips and the vaccine, Bill Gates, 5G, coronavirus overnight. That doesn't happen from one step to another. It's, it's a slow and gradual process, which is incubated through the echo chambering effect, where there's a sort of confirmation bias uh, and only seeing opinions which support your already held beliefs. This leads to people starting to believe more and more broad and outlandish things until suddenly they find themselves deeply embedded in this alternative worldview. The confirmation bias in the echo chamber uh, instills a sense that, the, that this is the real truth, and if people just did their own research, they'd realize that things aren't what they seem. Following on from this is a process of speaking to friends and family, like out of concern, likely out of concern for their well-being, uh, and generally in a somewhat well-meaning way, telling them all about the sort of research that they found online. Often the responses along the lines of being seen as lost down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, which leads those people to becoming increasingly isolated, not just from not just physically from their communities during lockdowns, but also from their intimate relationships with friends and families, pushing them to further seek support in these online communities or after the lockdowns in person with other like-minded people, further instilling these beliefs and making it harder to reach them again. So another cool feature of that process is the role of alternative media sources. A large part of the formation of the uh, protest block, I think, so. there yeah. Um, a large part of the formation of, these protest, of the protest block is the role of alternative media as an institution which has been detached from its traditional position. Traditional media has been developed over a long period of time through multiple mediums such as newspapers, radio, TV. Um, this, alongside the development of journalistic ethics, has developed an agreed upon process for the production of news and upholding truth and impartiality to an extent. The advent of social media has meant that anyone and everyone are no longer just consumers of media, but they're able to become publishers of media themselves, bypassing journalistic ethics completely and posting whatever they want, passing off opinions as fact. Is that the one? Oh, yeah, cool. um, this has led to a shift in the mainstream media today, which, uh, where there's a significant increase in the role of opinion pieces. So much so that some news media has become almost entirely opinion driven with traditional journalistic news relegated to the back pages. Throughout the pandemic leading up to this protest, uh, there's been a significant discourse around not trusting mainstream media as it seems a propaganda arm with the coercive state supporting mandates. This was emphasised by the constant repetition in protest circles of a statement by Jacinda Ardern in 2020 that we will continue to be your single source of truth unless you hear it from us, it's not the truth. This well-meaning statement likely backfired and might have led some government skeptics to really push against the mainstream media out of defiance of the statement alone. This not trusting mainstream media led to increasing, uh, people increasingly to seek news from alternative media sources such as Counterspin and other online social media based platforms. These platforms further instill the notion that mainstream media cannot be trusted and that alternative media is the only safe place to get information. This reciprocal process alongside the echo chamber I mentioned earlier, makes it incredibly difficult for people to break away once they begin down the rabbit hole. Uh, compounding this is the constant ridicule or derision from friends and family and the broader public, that these people are just conspiracy theorists and not jobs and are beyond helping at this point, which writes them off completely. What this culminates in is the development of a parallel culture. One which no longer intersects with the mainstream position at all, but which has mechanisms in place that reproduce its own ideological positions. Uh, it's this climate which led directly to the formation of the protest, despite the vast disparity in ideology, positions, and beliefs of the factions within the protest. So let's have a quick look at the factions. Um, so 
The protest itself was inspired at first by the Canadian trucker convoys uh, protesting vaccination mandates for crossing the US-Canada border. Uh, this ballooned into a pro uh, broader protest against COVID restrictions in general, attracting similarly fringe elements, particularly as it began to be steered by QAnon conspiracy theorists as the protests unfolded in Canada. The Canadian convoy through social media became what is effectively a recognisable brand, a shorthand for resistance to COVID measures. The organisers of the New Zealand convoy operated within an established framework and quickly gained recognition among potential supporters. They didn't need to delve into the details of their protest purpose or logistics, simply mentioning the term convoy was enough for everyone to understand the event. Following the creation of the Telegram group for the convoy, links had quickly circulated among New Zealand's anti-vaccine and anti-mandate and conspiracy communities online. Uh, influential figures within these circles began sharing invitations and joining the groups themselves, and within days of it being formed, uh, the group had amassed nearly 10,000 members. Uh, similar dynamics unfolded on Facebook, where invitations spread across various groups opposing COVID restrictions, as well as on personal profiles and broader pages. Within slightly over a week, the Convoy 2022 New Zealand Facebook group surged to over 60,000 members. The branding of the New Zealand Convoy drew inspiration from imagery used in analogous movements across the world. Uh, that's seen in the trucker logo, which I forgot to include, but that's okay. Uh, this trend isn't unique to New Zealand. Um, in the same week as the New Zealand convoy, COVID protest convoys were either planned or already underway in over two dozen countries. Posts promoting and commemorating these international events proliferate on platforms like Telegram and Facebook, with the Freedom Convoy shorthand serving to instantly convey the protest's nature and objectives. This process unfolds in other movements as well, not just COVID protest movements. So similar patterns emerge when you look at like, global protest movements like Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street, for example. Um, and the interconnected nature of social media facilitates the spontaneous expansion of well-publicized protests across borders. Once a protest brand is established, complete with defined values and methodologies and slogans, it's natural for like-minded groups to emulate and tailor them to the local context. This allows them to leverage the momentum and recognition of the broader movement to launch their own localised iterations. For New Zealand's convoy, this meant having a readily replicable template. Participants understood the cause, opposition to vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions, the approach, a convoy of vehicles headed to the capital, and the narrative, framed as a protest by discontented truck drivers, or in the case of New Zealand, workers more broadly. This was then articulated alongside unique conditions in Aotearoa and New Zealand, within, uh, with an incorporation of Tiro Ranga Tiratanga among some factions um, and other unique influences of the local social movement landscape and others. Briefly, I'm just going to talk about freedom as a phrase because it's, it's used a lot amongst pretty much every single group involved in the, in the protest in some way. It's an incredibly vague term. It has very little meaning in and of itself beyond a loose understanding of the concept of liberty. Um, this makes it incredibly useful as it's able to be articulated with almost any position due to its near empty meaning. It's an open or empty signifier as it functions as a vehicle for taking on the meanings of what it is articulated with, while not inherently having a meaning in and of itself in discourse. So it's important to think of the protest block more broadly as consisting of disparate factions along a continuum from fairly mundane of slightly fringe views against restrictions and mandates, all the way to far-right conspiracy theories and beliefs. Before we get to the factions, I just want to talk, I, I'd like to read out uh, the letter that was signed by a number of the groups in the faction, a uh, number of factions in the protest, um, which gives a good kind of outline of what the public discontent was being articulated against. Now, not every group agreed with this, and we'll get into that in a second, but the letter from uh, 14th of February, 2022. <clears throat> to the Honourable Members of Parliament, today marks one week since tens of thousands of New Zealanders from all walks of life, ages and ethnicities joined together in a peaceful protest. Those present at Parliament have travelled from all over the country to support the protest. They've been supported in many different ways by hundreds of thousands of Kiwis. They are united in condemning the government's flagrant breach of human rights, deliberate divisiveness and discrimination, the constant law changes are inconsistent with the government's duties to New Zealanders it was elected to represent. The protest is a result of immense frustration and concern. People are outraged by the conduct of the government and its lack of respect, dismissive attitude and unwillingness to engage. The people have travelled from all corners of the country to remind members of parliament of their duties as elected representatives. 
But it's time for the government to listen, but it's time for our government to recognize the sovereign rights of New Zealanders. This communication summarizes the views of the majority of groups present at Parliament today. Those represented are Convoy 2022 New Zealand, misspelled, Freedom Alliance, New Zealand Doctors Speaking Out with Science, Outdoors and Freedom Movement, the Freedom and Rights Coalition, and Voices for Freedom. All agree that the COVID-19 Public Health Response Act and all the orders and mandates made under that legislation must be revoked immediately. Those represented request an urgent meeting with the senior cabinet ministers to open dialogue. The mandates are, are unnecessary and need to be lifted. The infection fatality rate of Omicron is lower than the seasonal flu. Prior to the global pandemic, it was considered normal for 500 to 700 New Zealanders to die each year from the seasonal flu. On average, 100 Kiwis die each day from various causes. There needs to be perspective. The traffic light system, the no jab, no job laws and other mandates are discriminatory, not warranted and a breach of fundamental human rights. New Zealanders, our friends and the media from around the world watched in horror the deplorable and unlawful police conduct towards peaceful protesters, including women and children. This abhorrent and bullying conduct was instigated and perpetuated by the Speaker, Trevor Mallard. Our united request is to reinstate the principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good governance, and good faith. Participants are determined to maintain their presence until mandates end. This letter is being sent to all members of parliament and news media. We await your urgent response. Sincerely, Convey 2022 New Zealand, Freedom Alliance, New Zealand Doctors Speaking Out with Science, Outdoors and Freedom Movement, the Freedom and Rights Coalition, and Voices for Freedom. So that's the that's the letter that they sort of purported to support, or, or that was that was sort of the initial uh, with, within one week of the protest. That was the initial kind of aim of, of what they were trying to achieve. It's important to note here that this is the beginning of one of the first major rifts within the protest. Uh, Councilmen in particular coming out against this letter, stating that the groups involved were controlled opposition and hijacking and stuffing up every single thing. Um, so I'm just going to do a little brief overview of some of the factions and, and a sort of ideological contestation that they represent. So COVID, uh, sorry, Convoy 2022 were the initial organizers of the, of the protest. Um, the Freedom Convoy was inspired by the Canadian model, was developed in late January 2022. With the idea of vehicles converging from opposite ends of New Zealand on Wellington, uh, participants predominantly in vans and cars rather than trucks embarked on their journey on Waitangi Day, reaching Wellington two days later. Initially, their ambitions were modest. Uh, as one organiser, Derek Broomhall from Invercargill expressed, um, the plans were to make speeches on the steps of Parliament and leave letters there if necessary. The Convoy 2022 Facebook page, which at the time of the protests consisted of approximately 80,000 members, has since been shut down and their website is now completely defunct. Um, there's a mirroring here of the Canadian trucker protest where the initial organising group appears to have a more modest set of aims before being outvoiced and hijacked by more fringe or extreme positions. Um, the uh, next group is Voices for Freedom. So this group was founded by Claire Deeks, a patent lawyer and food blogger, uh, Alia Bland, a school teacher turned small business owner selling patents online, uh, and Libby Johnson, who runs an online knitting community and small business. It's, a, it's interesting to note here, thinking back to the earlier discussion I brought up, um, that of the online community spaces, that Voices for Freedom was formed from online craft groups from its onset, from its outset. Um, they represent sort of an articulation of, of wellness communities, uh, family values, and discontent, often appealing to middle-class, uh, middle-aged women, based on the communities that they come from. Um, Voices for Freedom, in their own kind of words, self purports to be a grassroots advocacy organisation established in December 2020, dedicated to safeguarding fundamental human rights in New Zealand, particularly freedom of speech, health, and medical freedom, amidst what they perceive as an overly oppressive COVID-19 response. Their campaigns advocate for balanced approaches to COVID-19 that uh, prioritise the well-being of vulnerable populations or respecting the rights of all citizens. They call for a New Zealand-specific strategy focusing on genuine health and personal empowerment, eschewing scare tactics, lockdowns, ineffective face coverings, and rushed experimental medicines. This is in their own words. Voices for Freedom emphasises honesty, sound science, government transparency, and individual freedom of choice without discrimination. They also recognise broader threats to freedoms and aims to address various international and local agendas through a multifaceted approach. Uh, their efforts target what they term the wobbly middle. This is a really interesting point here. Individuals unsure of how to navigate current issues, providing tools, platforms, and community connections to encourage individual and collective action. 
So Voices for Freedom claim to be a grassroots organization, but they appear to have significant resources. It's really hard to really trace where their funding is coming from. Um, they've since set up Reality Chip Radio, which I'm sure a lot of us have seen billboards for around the city. There's a lot of them. Um, which hosts several shows ranging from climate skepticism through to criticism of global governance to vaccine mandates, politics, etc. Um, they also encouraged a run of members and supporters in the 2022 local body elections, which was for the most part unsuccessful, but parallels Steve Bannon's contention during the Trump campaign to flood the zone with shit. Uh, using the phrase flood the zone quite often in their videos available at the time. Let's go next slide, please. Uh, the next one is Freedom and Rights Coalition. So, formed from Destiny Church, led by self appointed apostle and former self appointed bishop Brian Tarnagin. Uh, the group has organised a number of protests, such as the one uh, at the Auckland Domain during the lockdowns and a gathering at Parliament in November 2021, where a speaker claimed the media was, and I quote, an army of terrorists. Despite being led by Tamaki, he was unable to attend the protest, as Ferris mentioned, um, due to being on bail uh, charged with breaching the COVID response act. Tamaki claimed in a post the same day that that letter I just read out was, was signed, that New Zealand was going down the path of UN ideology of socialism. Um, they purport not to be an anti-vaccine group, but strongly for the end of mandates and control. Um, Tamaki further attacked politicians who supported the protest, such as Winston Peters, Matt King, ex-National MP, and Rodney Hyde, as clambering over each other for the limelight, basically worried that he was losing the media attention compared to them. Um, Freedom of Rights Coalition supplied a PA that was used for addresses throughout the protest when, one of the, when the organisers of Convoy hadn't thought to sort one out. Uh, internally, the group has been criticised for their religious background and is an example of the articulation of freedom with uh, Christianity in a broader sense. Uh, next slide, please. The next group is the Sovereign Hikwe of Truth. Um, I've got less on this one, but it's an interesting group. Uh, they're a sovereign citizen group, which is basically an ideology which has been transplanted from the US. Um, they adhere to a pseudo-legal pseudo -legal belief system rooted in misinterpretations of common law asserting that they're not bound by government statutes unless they're explicitly consenting to them. So they appear to be articulating sovereign citizens' belief on one hand with te roranga te roranga on the other, which exemplifies the adaptation of these ideas to the local context. Uh, next slide. The next group is the Freedom Alliance. It's actually really hard to work out who these guys are. They're a very loose coalition of freedom groups from the Wellington region, which tend to discuss the influence of things like the World Economic Forum, and similar conspiracies about world governments, water fluoridation, all those sorts of things. Next one. Uh, Outlaws and Freedoms Movement. So Sue Gray, I'm sure we've heard of her. Um, she's a conspiracy theorist lawyer who frequently appears on Counterspin. Um, she was the co-leader of the Outdoors Party in 2017, which received 0.1% of the total electoral vote. Um, subsequently, she became a prominent figure in the Baby W case um, and was held in custody for contempt of court during that time. Okay, next one. Uh, Counterspin. So, they're kind of an InfoWars inspired alternative media outlet headed up by Calvin Alp and Hannah Spira. During the protest, they were running day long live streams, um, vehemently denied the, even the existence of the virus in the first place, and urged a complete overthrowing of the government. Alp claimed during the protests that the government was practicing genocide through the use of the vaccine and was pursuing the transhumanist agenda of the Great Reset. Uh, Councilmen frequently denounce other groups and people throughout the protest with claims of false flags being planted and controlled oppositions. At the time, Councilmen was the most substantial alternative media group uh, involved in reporting, involved in and reporting on the protest. Since then, they've dropped off completely. Um, they are, have been significantly overtaken by Reality Check Radio and groups like that. Um, so I haven't covered sort of even half the groups or factions in depth here, but each of these factions represents a different challenge to the hegemonic order, an articulation of public discontent with alternative ideological positions. These represent contention with the status quo and suggest that as these contentions picked up some degree of popular support among protesters, that we are in a period of interregnum as contention becomes increasingly publicly visible. Go next slide. Okay, so final section. Uh, into the interregnum, kind of, where are we now? Um, post protest so you've got Act in New Zealand First during the previous election, we're courting the protesters more broadly, which lends legitimacy to the protest as its own political block of sorts, sort of a heterogeneous block, because they're not internally consistent. They have a very vast array of beliefs within them, but they are being treated as a political block in themselves. Um, as we've sort of pivoted away from, uh, these groups have pivoted away from mandates, 
um, as we've gone back to kind of whatever we call normal now. Um, the articulation of discontent has become against things like co-governance, tertiary, um, on the one hand, and broader cultural war issues, particularly LGBT issues and trans rights on the other. This is somewhat indicative too of the dual crisis, in that uh, ACT, including the removal of the treaty from policy as a guiding set of principles for the formation of the state project, lends itself to the idea that the colonial aspect of the dual crisis is definitely unsettled once more. One argument that could be made is that due to Aotearoa's unique makeup being built on the treaty as a constitutional document and the rights of Tanga Te Whenua in having a say over the use of land resources, this acts as a break on rampant and unbridled capitalism in New Zealand. To remove the principles of the treaty from policies such as the Resource Management Act is to remove that break and would allow capital to plunder the country uninhibited. This would allow, as an example, the extraction of mineral resources such as oil and mining without resistance, as the legal framework that gives iwi a say over land uh, would be removed. New Zealand is incredibly unique in the world in having indigenous rights serve as a break on capital, and to get rid of the treaty as a living political document would be to remove one of the most unique and important parts of the makeup of Aotearoa New Zealand as a state project. This is sort of in parallel right now with the use of fast-track legislation uh, at a rate far outpacing any government so far with a threat that this may be used for consenting extractive industry, uh, effectively bypassing any restrictions altogether. Okay, so just want to conclude now. The key points I want to keep people in, you know, keep in mind for people is the parliament protest is an indicator which suggests that the hegemonic order is unsettled. The protests are a highly visible display of public discontent, showing us that irrespective of the actual contentions, the dominant hegemonic order is able to be contested and thus it suggests we're living in a period of interregnum. The dual crisis is also visible as the shift away from mandates among a lot of these factions towards concerns over co-governance, the role of the treaty, and the legitimising of these claims by the current coalition government shows that the colonial aspect of the dual crisis is once again unsettled. This along the, alongside the unsettled nature of capital in the present, uh, both globally and globally with inflation and more locally with things like the cost of living crisis, uh, show us that we are basically in a period where transition can happen. Uh, and that's about all I've got. So thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Tom. Um, I think we'll have about a 15 minute break. Come back at 20 past, gonna have a smoke, get a drink, um, and then we'll have some questions. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm have some questions. So, um, I guess I'll be chairing. Um, so, if you've got a question, just raise your hands and I'll um, you know, pick you up. Yeah. Who's got questions? No questions. Questions? Yeah. Like, oh, I was wondering. Uh, while your research is clearly about like what the, this event symbolised mm -hmm. as a shift in society, um, surely there was points where you were tempted yourself to deep dive into the actual origins of COVID and, 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 and maybe some more schizo ideas about yeah. how this is actually proliferating or not. Mm -hmm. I was wondering you know, if that was something that you experienced or that was a scary thing that you yeah, it's it's definitely something I, I, for the context of the research, it's important to kind of look at what are all the different views on this and how do we sort of get there. But because I mean, during the during the pandemic itself, was, I found it fun to kind of look into these things. Yeah. Definitely from a, of a curiosity of what's out there perspective yeah. rather than like really deeply believing in these things perspective. Yeah. Um, but I mean, initially I wasn't even looking at the progress for my thesis research. Right. It just kind of happened. Um, but yeah, they're definitely. It's definitely find it interesting to sort of you know, look at the, the depth of, of, of this stuff, for sure. Okay. So I saw you at one before, Kira. Yes? Uh, I'm curious about how you describe it as a um, government, as a, like a wartime government. Mm -hmm. I have a difficulty with that one because okay. um, the last wartime government we had mm -hmm. was brought about by a super majority vote mm -hmm. by requested actually by the king, mm -hmm. the queen's father. Um, and I think an opportunity was actually lost when 
Nikki Kaye decided not to put her hand up to become mm. the leader of the National Party. I mm. think that, that quite possibly could have happened then. And hence the election could have been delayed to around about the time of when that parliament practice happened. Mm. So I, I, I kind of wonder about the impact of that. Mm. And also, potential impact of that. And I also wonder about the, the fact that right now Michael Baker is putting a lot of pressure on the present government about long COVID. Mm. Um, the fact that, um, Maybe even Shane Reddy sort of picked up on it, mm. you know, and, and what that could actually do. Because mm. you know, suddenly they may have to be taking COVID, leaving a COVID response. I mean, there's a possibility that vaccines don't work again, mm. and the, 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 the virus is up to, you know, um, <coughs> supersede the vaccine to be able to resistance to it. So mm. there's all these other possibilities. So, what do you think could be the could have been the impact of that. <laughs> Nikki Kay and Jacinda mm -hmm. doing something together and, mm -hmm. and the possibility of long COVID causing national to have to, right? Mm. I'll start with the second part because it's, it's easier yeah. um, in a way. I, I, I do think the- Could you thing, repeat the question into the mic, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. It's quite, quite raw, but- Are uh, you yeah, sum up what I see? Yeah, um, just a summary. Well, the second part was basically about how long COVID. Do you give us a brief run up? Well, um, <laughs> you, can, you can jump up. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, okay. Um, no, I, I, was, I was talking about. Um, I, I was talking, talking about the, the, the possibility of, of long COVID um, becoming an issue and also the possibility of. Um, the, of, um, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist when I say this, but about the vaccine, oh, I mean, the, a, 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 the form of the virus being able to form a resistance to the vaccine. And, and suddenly, National having to take the whole thing seriously. <coughs> Just like, like Labour when they were in government, I also talked about um, how <laughs> Nikki Kay had become the leader of the, of the National Party, quite possibly here in. Uh, her and uh, Jacinda right there would have formed what I call a real genuine wartime, more like government, because that actually involved uh, both National and Labour having to, you know, form a wartime cabinet, you know, and it was from the request from the Queen, uh, the King rather, the Queen may have made the same request, uh, call off your election, do this. And I, 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 I think the election could have only possibly been held at the time of the Parliament protest. I mean, I don't know if that is a question, I mean, I'm just, a question I'm asking really. How do you think these things could, could have done things or could do things? Mm, yeah. You know? And you're talking about the direct and here and seeing what does that do to all that. Yeah, for sure, thank you. Um, thinking about the long COVID thing, I think any, any response that this current government has is we went from having governments in what we call unprecedented times, now we have a precedent for these things. That's, that's the key thing really, is that there, there has been a process that we've followed over, over the course of learning during the pandemic, um, that there is a precedent set for how we deal with these sorts of things in the modern age compared to say, the Spanish flu or, or something, you know, 100 years ago or whatever. Um, in saying that though, this current government has, if you look at the kind of way that those parties responded to the COVID response in the first place, other than national. Actually, New Zealand first were quite against lockdowns, quite against the mandates and things like that from the beginning. Or quite, we're a lot more liberal with the idea of, of being open borders, open uh, to people kind of getting it and moving on. Um, the part about the vaccine not working, I guess it's just one of those things of it, people are constantly iterating on it and, and developing it as new strains pop up, so it's kind of hard to, hard to say. Um, the Warsaw government thing, I think it's a, it's, it's more useful to think of it as a metaphorical wartime government, not so directly as, as an actual wartime government when you have a direct cross-coalition. But it served as a cross-coalition for things like the lockdown specifically. Um, and I think that's the key part of it, really. I don't think it's necessarily... I, I'm not sure how it would have unfolded or where we would be, speculatively, if, if there was a cross-coalition government. We'd be having a very different conversation, I think. Yeah, mate. Got it. Um, you mentioned with things like counselling, for instance, um, it seems you're aware of the trajectory. <laughs> <laughs>
You should get back to this No, you didn't. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, counterspin media and its trajectory is now sort of being superseded by reality check, you said. I'm, I'm curious about um, the trajectory of some of these other organizations, particularly you mentioned the Sovereignty Koya Truth, and mm. that there was quite a large presence of Tonga Tafenua there, or mm. Kopapa Māori groups. Um, you also, of course, talked about how Act New Zealand First has been calling support from this rather amorphous protest block, yeah. but um, I'm curious about how, for instance, some of these more, uh, the, some of these groups from Te Ao Māori might um, consider them being courted or otherwise by mm -hmm. parties like Act in New Zealand First. <coughs> um, I think it's the, that, that's a good example of the fracturing of the whole thing post protest as well. I mean, it, it isn't a homologous <coughs> block. It is heterogeneous. It is it is full of very vast different opinions and and. It's treated in some ways as a coherent political bloc, but there's definitely people dropping off and people realizing that like the beliefs they had during this time may not necessarily reflect reality. Um, you know, people are coming back around um, to an extent. I think things like the way Act New Zealand First have been acting um, around satility has been a, a, a catalyst for some people to actually leave these movements in a way. Particularly, I, I mean, I haven't really followed Sovereignty Coy of Truth from, I mean, they haven't been particularly active, uh, visibly, in the same way, but there is definitely a shift that has happened since the protests, and that kind of reflects what I was saying with the shift away from once the mandates thing was kind of resolved, you have some people, uh, taking it back a step, I guess this is very similar to the way that uh, during, another example, so during Black Lives Matter, for example, you have uh, a large, broad population of people who are joining this protest movement who then as they kind of get a response saying, oh, you know, everything is all good now, the police are being defunded, well, we'll fix it. You have a certain number of people drop off and the momentum kind of stalls out. A very similar sort of thing is happening now in that you have a momentum stalling out post mandates kind of being resolved, um, where a lot of the people who were, you know, diehard fans of the, of the, of the protest movement kind of thing, people who just had, you know, strong beliefs around it, have dropped off to an extent, and, that, and I think that's another example of, of, of a second step of the drop off um, where you have Acting New Zealand first trying to remove certainty from policy uh, to an extent. I hope that kind of vaguely answers your question. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Come on. Thanks for your presentation. I'm just wondering if you would like unpack the whole interregnum thing. Uh, uh, a challenge to the status quo because mm -hmm. it seems post election it seems like a lot of it's been this the protest movement has been incorporated into the government. Mm. We now have New Zealand First MPs that are actually part were part of this movement in government. Mm. Mm. So how, do you see do you see that government as inherently unstable? Then is that is that what you're getting at with the or is it just a part? Is it just a temporary? kind of move to the right and then we'll have another into the middle field. Mm. I think the, the interregnum is, is apolitical in some ways. It's it doesn't necessarily have to be a left or a right thing. It's it this this current government represents the interregnum in so much as that it includes challenges to the neoliberal status quo that we've had for the last thirty years. Um, it's I think the, the key thing to really think about is that the interregnum is the period where it's not necessarily like a shift from one thing to another, but it's a breaking down. We've got reiteration of certain things. You've got neoliberal policy, uh, like market fundamentals and things like that being re-embedded, but it's, it's with a different context. It's, it's in a different way. It's, it's articulated with different things. Um, it's a period where we are trying the same old things with new things attached to them, uh, in, in a way. Um, and that whether we have a left or a right government in place is almost irrelevant to the fact that we are trialing new things until we can find kind of a broad co a, a broad consensus across the board where you've got a majority of people who effectively shift their common sense towards whatever the ruling class ideology is. Um, yeah, that's thanks. Thank you. Uh, any more? Yep. Do you want to make a prediction? <laughs> <laughs> you have to. <laughs> <laughs> About what? 
Brian. Just in general? Yeah. Oh, it's going to continue to be kind of a, a the if hustle, as, as people call them. You know, it's, it's a money making, it's, it's prosperity doctrine, it's a money making scheme. So that's the prediction. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Sorry. Um, how does this make you feel, Tom? Generally? Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Well, I mean, like, being in an interregnum. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that word spoken before. I didn't know how it was pronounced. <laughs> um, like, literally being like, we're in this time of change, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like, does that make you feel hopeful? Do you feel horrific? Do you, you know? I'm going to be real cliche and go back to Gramsci again with the, with the quote. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the idea of pessimism of the intellect to optimism of the world. You know, it's that idea that you've got to be really honest and pessimistic and understanding about the fact that we need to realize that things are going pretty wrong in some ways. You know, there's, there's a pessimism around that. But optimistic about the fact that we can actually, in understanding it, work out a plan to change it or to, to do something with it. You know, a lot of what I'm working with is the idea of why did the protest go the way that it did and not say a resurgent labor movement or a, a left bloc or, or you know that sort of thing? Why why did this sort of vast group of, of discontented middle class and lower class people, working class people, become caught up in this kind of conspiracist um, direction in some ways? The interregnum is is very open ended. Um, it's kind of exciting in a very scary way. I think is a, is a good way to put it. Um, you know, we have the capacity here, the opportunity, and the possibility here to make a big change in, in the world. But it's going to take us time to rebuild, it's going to take us time to get back to where we were or even start again. Um, you know, the left as a bloc has been facing significant kind of breakdown over the last few, uh, through the neoliberal hegemony, like uh, the dismantling of, of unions, for example. Um, it's going to take us. It's exciting to think that we can potentially rebuild some of the stuff, but also build new iterations of it and, and respond to the context that we're in now. Um, so yeah, I think my, my feelings towards it are excited but afraid in a good way. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? So the question was, uh, do, do I think the vaccine mandates were more of a vehicle for the interregnum? I don't think so. I think they were a precipitating incident that, that led to a kind of um, eruption of this whole crisis, eruption of this whole discontent. You know, it's something for people to kind of organize around. Um, because it hasn't happened in the past. We've had a lot of vaccine policies yeah. in the past, and New Zealand has not ever Absolutely, yeah. Never, it never gets not, not in the same way, no. And, and I think it's, I think a, a factor of it is the fact that it costs people their jobs, in some way. Um, I think, I think a lot of people, once their livelihood is kind of uh, threatened, it does become um, a lot more personal in a lot of ways compared to say when we had the uh, other other sort of anti-vax movements with like the MMR vaccine, for example. Yeah. Um, it, it's a lot more solidified because it's not about the vaccine in, in, in and of itself. It's about the fact that that represents a removal from society in a way. Um, so they haven't actually had that job, haven't they? It may have been different. I, I think if they hadn't lost their jobs, was the, was the way that was phrased there. So if, if people hadn't lost their jobs, if the mandates weren't in place, I don't necessarily think that the protest group would have grown the way that it did. I think it was a really strong precipitating crisis point for people. Thank you. Yeah, Christian from last year. Um, so, from your perspective, how would you describe and frame the response to the discontent of these people from the left of the time? Can I get the answer? Um, from your perspective, how would you describe and frame the response to the discontent of these people from the left of the time? Like, what was the left doing? So, how, the question was, so how would I frame or understand the uh, response of the left to this discontent at the time. I think that followed the kind of fracturing of the left that we've seen for the last 20, 30 years uh, quite significantly. You had a lot of, I mean, I wasn't overly online at the time, and everything else was overly online at the time. Um, so I think that the left is, it, again, it's hard to kind of narrow it down to one specific opinion. It's, it's such a broad array of opinions to sort of consider. Um, 
I do think there was a lot of writing these people, as, as the sort of liberal mainstream did as well, writing these people off as kind of a lost cause. Um, in, in that, you know, once they're down this rabbit hole, it's kind of not worth trying to get them out again. And, and a lot of the research that's come out since has kind of been summarised along the lines of look at how stupid these people are for believing this stuff, which isn't particularly useful. I, I, I think it's more important for us to consider why or how did people get to believing these things than it is to sort of start with what they're believing at all. What they're believing is kind of irrelevant in this, in this discussion. It's, it's the process of how they got to that point. Uh, and I do think a lot of the left response online, particularly Twitter and things like that, was the ridiculing thing, which then, again, going back to what I was saying, it's that process of reading, being, or like reproducing this, this isolation for this group of people to the, to the extent that they become a parallel culture. To the extent that they're kind of so separated from the mainstream culture that they become their own kind of thing. Um, do you believe that people were actually duped into this, or did they have agency over their own decisions Great to attend the process? Great question. I think that I don't think there's a duping going on necessarily. I think it's that people are searching for answers. They have this fear. They have this discontent. They have this understanding that like something's not quite right with the system, and we're not sure why. The answers that they find are in these communities. It's, it's in these areas where um, these sort of, and again, this is representative of the fact that the factions are so disparate, so vast. Um, the difference of beliefs within the, within the process itself represents the, different, the vast array of kind of answers people receive. I don't think they were duped so much as that was the answer they found, and that's kind of the path that they took. Now, I, don't, I don't think it's a, people aren't stupid for falling for this stuff. It's, it's, it's a very powerful process. Um, you know, any of us could do it. And this, and this is represented in the fact that it's not just uneducated people like some people frame it, it's, it's across the whole board. It's, it's, you know, people of all education, income range, um, class, race, gender, etc. It's, it's, it's a very vast array. It's, it's the bulk of, you know, the populace. Um, you know, across every strata, there are people within that that um, have, have kind of gone down this path. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I think we'll have. Yeah. I think I think we'll ask two more questions and then. Thank you. Uh, actually, I just want to share an experience. Uh, Please. So first, I uh, came to Wellington. I moved from Crash to Wellington. That was the protest has started. Mm -hmm. So it was quite not shocking for me, but I found it interesting. So and my house was close to the park, and mm -hmm. I went there and I saw those people. But uh, I think, uh, as I think it was in your question, that the first thing that came to my mind that they are a part of this society as well. So they were citizens, they were New Zealanders. So I was thinking that uh, <clears throat> And the uh, whole left or people who are not agree with them, the way uh, they rejected them, the way they humiliate them, I think that was not a radical act. The radical act is to what you did, try to understand them, because they are a part of the society. So that was my experience because it was the first uh, like thing that I experienced in Wellington still is stay in my mind and I was thinking about it. And people were warning me that don't go there or be careful. But uh, I think the whole the way that people, especially on Twitter mm -hmm. or social media or media, uh, treated them, I think that was not a, a proper act. That was, Never just I want to put a comment. Yeah. The Thank you. Just. Um, just wondering from your work on this, um, so you hit it with disparate groups, is there any idea from what you've looked at of what they actually wanted, their vision of society, should we say? That's what, what were they, because there's all kinds of, we're against the government, we're against the system, but is there, you know, in some ways it's a communistic government, blah, 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 is there anything overall of what they, beyond the mandate, mm. what they wanted? 
short answer, no. That's, that's the key thing, really. I mean, this is why I think it represents the interregnum in a lot of ways, is that it doesn't necessarily offer a coherent alternative path forward. It's, it's so fractured. It represents the fact that we have these different iterations of things that try and fix things, rather than going, hey, like, let's, let's build a new project. It's not a, it's not a counter hegemony anyway. It's definitely a um, kind of vast array of, of, of potential paths forward, but it's, it, it doesn't have consensus. It doesn't have, uh, even, even amongst the protesters, it doesn't have an internal consensus beyond the stop mandates part. Um, which I think what is what makes it the most interesting thing, really, is, is that it's not it's not that easy, it's not that straightforward. Um, so should it have been that way, it would be a lot easier to talk about this stuff, I think. Um, but realistically, it represents such a disparate, vast array of, of opinions and beliefs and understandings and, and kind of ideas of how to resolve this stuff that it is just a part of that kind of contention in general. Um, hopefully that, that answers your question. One more. Okay, so I have um, two things. I was thinking, like, one, if what we are seeking is an articulation of a coherent path forward, I think we should look to my tiki mai. Yes. And I just wanted to Agreed. put that in the room. Um, and then second is, um, yeah, I kind of just, like, was thinking about the um, fact that you ended the conversation with things are ripe for transformation because, you know, up to the question of hope and stuff, you know, I, I think that if you're seeking that, it's it's affirming to kind of hear these things. And, and you know, my feeling is that the state project itself is unstable. Mm. Um, even, you know, like, if we think about the fact that, like, states 400 years ago, that's kind of when they were in, like, the beginning, but then also that kind of coincides with the colonial project, mm -hmm. and it kind of also coincides with capitalism. And so I think, you know, that's really interesting, particularly when we're drawing lessons from, like, the European authors like Gramsci. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, as I think you kind of said, uh, the, the situation being right for transformation is, like, particularly specific in New Zealand, I think, because of our um, relationship with Tatility. Mm -hmm. um, Oh no, I lost my mind. Well, we went deeply overdue for a constitutional crisis. Yeah, totally. Um, let's go. Um, and so, actually, what I was kind of thinking about in, in, in regards to all that, like specifically, was that one of my favorite kind of anecdotes from your um, talk was about the Hare Krishnas and the patched gang members hanging out. And I was thinking about the fact that social reproduction has been one of the, like, mm. a huge uh, casualty of neoliberalism. Mm. And how I, you know, like you've been examining the behaviors of these different groups and how they will be kind of interacting, and you know, I was just wondering if there were any kind of things that stood out to you in terms of, I don't know, practices of, of social reproduction or ways of gathering or whatever that were not mm. political but were just about bringing people together. Yeah. Mm. I forgot the first part of what you asked. I was kind of Kind of just check, right? Yeah, so reproduction. Okay, so I, I think it represents that there is a capacity for social reproduction in that respect. Right? It represents that there is a kind of there's a lot of questions to ask around why it went the way that it did, um, and through the process. I guess can we like learn anything? Like, is there things that you have like noticed or feel like you can learn from from the ways that? these different groups and all their differences have managed to interact with each other? Mm, I think it's, it's, the only reason it really unfolded the way that it does is because there was a precipitating crisis that there was something to articulate around. There was something to sort of build around in terms of the mandates. Had, had we not had the mandates at all, I don't think the process would have happened in the same way. Um, I do think that these groups would have formed regardless. I do think these groups were formed from the kind of general isolation that happened during the, the, the process, uh, sorry, the COVID period. But I don't think had things been different with, with the with the mandates that uh, we would have seen the same thing. I kind of want to just riff on the, the imagination thing that you sort of brought up there in terms of uh, kind of a good place to end it really is, is the interregnum and the kind of period we've just been through and, and where we are now because it is ripe for transition and change, it 
it's really important that we go away and think about what the future might look like or could look like. There is a capacity for change here. There is a potential for us to do something with this moment. Um, and I sort of want to challenge everyone to think what that might look like or what they'd like that to look like even um, going forward. Because we can do something with this. There's, 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 chance, there's opportunity here. Um, and, and we can't allow it to just kind of pass us by and allow the kind of right in whatever broad sense to dominate the moment. Um, you know, it's, it's important that we take lessons away from how do these communities form? How could we do it differently if it was a left group? Or how could we do it differently if we weren't kind of conspiracy driven or, or, or whatever? Um, you know, how could we bring social cohesion back in some way? How do we build these social movements again? Um, and what future would be like? to have. Uh, it's a really nice place to end it, to be honest. Great. Thank you so much for coming.